This new book is Team of Vipers. The author, Cliff Sims, joins me now. Thanks very much for, for being with yeah, us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, uh, I got a lot of questions for you. We've we got, we got a good amount of time. So you, in the book, you write about how you sometimes drafted possible tweets for the president. Did you ever expect that you would be on the receiving <laughs> end of one of his tweets? Definitely not while I was there, but you know, when you approach doing a book like this, especially if you want to do a, an honest book, which I tried to do, uh, it certainly crosses your mind. You think there's a chance, because the history, you've seen the way that he's done this to, to others in the past. Right. So definitely thought going into the book that there was a, a chance that would happen. And, and just to be clear, do, do you know, I mean, did you sign a non- uh, disparagement agreement, a non-disclosure agreement? I assume that I signed whatever Sean Spicer did in the White House. I assume I signed whatever Corey Lewandowski and Dave Bossie so did So are you the worried campaign. about being sued? I just don't really, no, no. I mean, at this point, all it is is tweets. I haven't seen any, you know, haven't been sent anything on that. So mm -hmm. just kind of wait and see on that. Um, the, w uh, why do you think the president uh, is so upset? I think it probably has, honestly, more to do with the coverage of the book than it does the book itself. Because he hasn't he read the book. Um, hasn't, he hasn't read it. it. He, he, won't, he won't read it, and, and that's okay. Uh, I think that it's uh, a point for him of frustration, the portrayal of the White House as being chaotic. Uh, and I do portray that in certain scenes. Right. Uh, I think actually if he read the book, he probably wouldn't be as mad. Although, um, well, let, let me just say, I was just kind of reading this paragraph, this line, you say, uh, the 15 months you were there, it was the most cutthroat, toxic, mean-spirited, draining work environment you had ever encountered. Yes. That, that, that's not good. Yeah, no, it's, it's not. And, and, and it was definitely a tough place to work. I mean, look, there's a reason the book is called Team of Vipers. Right. Uh, I point out in there that I was a participant in some of that. Right. And, uh, and that's an important part of me, uh, to me about this book is that if I want to be honest about everything that's going on there, including the things that you just said, I have to be willing to well, do that about myself. It's too, one of the things know? I actually found interesting about the book because, you know, most people who write books, they end up being the star of the book and also the best person in the book. Right. You, you know, you talk a lot about your faith and how important that is and, and how that is, is probably the most important thing in your life, how you live your life. Definitely. Um, and yet you look back on how you changed in this White House, yeah. how being in this environment brought out uh, awful things in you. I mean, mm -hmm. that you did things that, you, you know, here in the book, you say, we leaked, we schemed, we backstabbed. The once clear lines between right and wrong, good and evil, light and darkness were eroded until only a faint, faint wrinkle remained. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, how does that happen? Yeah, well, it revealed a lot about myself. I learned a lot about myself there, and I can only speak from my personal experience that I never had that kind of proximity to power. I never got to interact with the most powerful person in the world. And so... I suddenly found myself a participant in this game of thrones, basically, mm. where it's like, I, well, I need to, uh, you know, mush, push this person out so that I can get a better position, or they're coming after me, so I'm going to come after them. And the in scene order in the book, to maintain proximity to sure, yeah, power. I mean, the the scene in the book that's got a lot of pickup is the so-called Trump enemies list, where he's frustrated because he sees all this coverage of people in his, on his own staff saying bad things about him anonymously. Right. And I come in and he said, "Who do we think these people are?" And I start listing people, and I justified it in the moment by saying, this is good for the president because these people shouldn't be here. And in retrospect, it was good for me. Mm. I didn't want them there because they were my quote-unquote enemies inside the building. And so I justified any number of things like that, you know, to, to, to get ahead. And uh, I regret that, but I think uh, it I learned from it. Because I mean, you used the quote how, you know, power corrupts, but you also say that w what you've really learned is that it reveals yeah, yeah. things about you. Definitely weaknesses yeah. in you. Totally. I mean, I, think I say things like, I had a warrior spirit but lacked a servant's heart. I mean, I think that's ultimately what we want in our leaders and the people that are serving our country are people that have a servant's heart. And uh, I'm by disposition a nice person because I'm from the South, I'm from Alabama, but I, I, it revealed kind of a part of my character, uh, um, inherent meanness. Does this president have a servant's heart? Oh, man. Um, I think in some ways uh, he does and in a lot of ways he doesn't. The idea of there being chaos in the White House is one of the things that particularly angers the president. We've, you just said that, and also we've heard that time and time again. Uh, you write at one point, it's impossible to deny how absolutely out of control the White House staff, again, myself included, was at times. Can you explain that? Was it yeah. just the 
I mean, the lack of organization from the very beginning? I or think was it the cast of characters? Th who there, there are several reasons for that. I think part of it is Trump's management style, which is very freewheeling, open-door policy in the Oval Office, that kind of thing. I think he had a weak chief of staff when you come in at first, so it was not able to really impose a lot of the, the process. And also, there, was not, there were not many people there who had ever worked in a White House before to even know what those processes would right. be. So it was kind of like everybody's learning. At the same time, you've kind of thrust together these two kind of overall factions where you have the Trump loyalists, the RNC people, they're at odds, so we're fighting each other while we're fighting the press, we're fighting everybody else. So all of those things combined created a, a pretty tough environment. Could you believe what the president said to you? I mean, because it seems like, look, I, he, the president says a lot of stuff that's just not true. He may think it's true, but it's just factually incorrect. Sarah Sanders has gone out there saying things. She now, rather than says this is factual, she'll say the president says this. Did you, you know, when you're interacting with the president and he tells you the sky is blue today, do you believe <laughs> right. him or do you check? Yeah, I think it's just like the great paradox of the Trump presidency that you've got a guy who, you know, he's had more Washington Post Pinocchios than every president combined, mm. and yet at the same time is perhaps the most authentic person to ever hold the office in a way. In, and how, how do you think he's authentic? Just in the way that he basically looked at the American people and said, this is who I am. Mm. You know everything about me. He's pretty much the, exactly the same behind the scenes that he is out in public. And I think that resonates with some people. So even the things you hear about him that are bad, it's not like anyone's surprised, mm. which is one of the reasons I think why a lot of the things that seem mm. like just mega hits on him never really land because everybody's like, well, I kind of already knew that. But it's know? interesting also, as a per uh, again, as a person of faith, um, you know, you write in the book that, that I don't want to misquote, you write, Donald Trump is not a religious man. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though I think yesterday he tweeted in support of Bible literacy being yeah. taught in public schools. I mean, do you, he has portrayed himself as a religious man, mm -hmm. even though when asked, you know, during the campaign, has he ever asked for forgiveness, which is a core tenet sure. of Christianity. Yeah. Uh, you know, he couldn't remember a time that he did that. Do you, you, you believe he is not a religious man. Does he go to church? Uh, no, not that I know of. Uh, I think Franklin Graham probably said it better than I can. Uh, he said that Donald Trump is not a great picture of the Christian faith. He has, from a policy perspective, been a great defender of it in a lot of ways. Right, you I like the judges he's put in power, course, things like that. Of course, of course, yeah. I think every Christian will be eternally grateful for, for some of those policies. But you can look past that. I mean, as a person of strong faith, you can look past okay, the affairs, the allegations of affairs, you know, all the, the tweets, everything, as long as what he's doing serves a greater good. I don't think that you look past it. Look, what I try to do in this book, though, is try to help people get inside his head and understand what makes him tick. One of the things you have to understand about Donald Trump is while, uh, you know, everyone is raised with a certain moral hierarchy, the things that they feel like are important morals to have. For Donald Trump, the highest moral is winning, and he will do whatever he has to do to win. And when you understand that, then all of these other things that he does make a little bit more sense. Right, but, it, but the highest moral is winning. For him, winning is money, really. I mean, isn't, I mean throughout most of his life. Well, I think winning, money. winning uh, money and winning an election and yeah. all of those things. I mean, one of the things at the end of the book that I really wrestle with is, you know, what, what does all this mean for Donald Trump? I mean, when he's 85 years old and he's back in Trump Tower, is he going to be fulfilled because he got, he was the most famous person in history and that he you know, won the presidency or whatever, or is he going to be like the rest of us and want to have those personal connections that he kind of hasn't had in his life, in mm -hmm. my view? Uh, and that kind of made it, it's a deeper question for all of us, and I think for me, too, is something I took away from my time. Uh, I just, since you know something about the, the whole tweeting system, the kefefe thing, <laughs> any insight? I don't know exactly what I mean, happened. We, we all kind of speculate. finally admit that that, that was just a mistake? That uh, there, yes. But Sean that Spicer was, said that a core group, I think it was, knows what it is. That was one of the most hilarious things I've ever seen in my life. Just like, you know, he says, Sean out there, just tell him, you know, the people who need to know, know. And so Sean marches so the out there told, dutifully. So said that to Sean. Yes, yeah, so he marches out there dutifully and says, the people who need to know, know. <laughs> you know I mean? Of course, behind the scenes, we're just kind of like either laughing or rolling uh, out or whatever. But uh, It's a fascinating book, and uh, there's a lot in it. Uh, I appreciate you, uh, you taking the time uh, to talk Thanks for having us. me.